Okay. Well, um, you know, as, as we all know, when we choose our doctoral topic, they always tell us to choose something near and dear to your heart because you're going to be living with it for a very long time. Um, and, you know, one of the, the big questions that I've always had is about the affective domain and can we actually influence um, our students. And I often used to wonder, I said, you know, they always say that the way to influence the affective domain is role modeling, but nobody really shows you how to do it. And I, I kept saying to myself, well, I'm doing unto others as I would expect them to do unto me. How come they're not doing it back, you know? So I decided that I would like to take a look at um, the use of role modeling in the uh, educational process um, really understand it a little bit more and uh, try and figure out is does it work because um, I didn't know what the literature was out there and um, caring is one of my big focuses and I think you know um, we're always saying that's one of the core values of nursing uh, so when we look at caring the literature all says that you know caring is absolutely essential for not only human health but even the uh, in the animal world that bonding with a mother is essential we all know that even animals don't thrive unless they have not just feeding and watering but a, a human bond or a connection with someone uh, so uh, for nursing it's a core nursing value um, something that I thought of just the other day, though, was I said, not only is it essential for human health, but in the healthcare field, I think it's very essential for safety. You know, one of the big thrusts nowadays is safety, and um, people who care more are more diligent and a little more careful about what they do. Uh, so I said, hmm, I hadn't thought about it in that way. Maybe that's, you know, a free dissertation idea for somebody. So we might want to pursue that. Now, the, the question that always comes up is, can you teach it? Can you really teach somebody to care or not? Um, I think the jury's still out on that one. I don't have the answer to that. But I did want to see, is there a way to influence it at least? So the question is, can you teach values? If you can, how do you teach values? And when you look in the literature, they always say role modeling is how people learn their values. But nobody ever teaches you how to role model. Is there a technique to it? I didn't learn it, and I've been through a lot of, you know, my master's is in education and my doctorate's in education. And I found out that there were a lot of myths regarding the role modeling process. So I'm going to share some of those with you as I was building my instrument. I had to incorporate those in there. Um, so, uh, so how do you role model? And you know, of course, the other question is, does it work? <laughs> so um, again, some of these things I did get a chance to answer. Some of them still open for, uh, for more research. That's always what we do, right? So what I did with this study, uh, it's a um, descriptive correlational study. And I wanted to find out what people do to role model, so what the current beliefs and practices are. As I said, there are a lot of myths about it, and if people buy into the myths, maybe they might hesitate to put themselves forward as role models. So I wanted to see what the understanding was of the nursing faculty, and I wanted to see if I could find any correlation between the behaviors of role modeling in the nursing faculty showing the students how to care, did it seem to make a difference? Do we produce caring, um, caring students? So, I, you know, one of my favorite things is they always say there's something different about the Malloy nurse. And I always tell the students, it's not the knowledge because everybody has to have the same knowledge to pass the board. So it's got to be in the attitude, something about the attitude. So, um, you know, so I wanted to look at can we influence those kinds of things? So obviously, first place to go is the literature review. So I had to look at the literature on caring and also on role modeling and values and attitudes as well to find out where to start. Um, I used several theorists for the caring model. Obviously, Jean Watson jumped right to mind, but there are 
um, Nell Nottings, who uh, is a very theoretical writer, and uh, Milton Meyerhoff uh, also did work on caring a long time ago. So uh, a lot of this work is Jean Watson, but you will see some other people's influences in here. And I was looking at professional caring because there are many different levels of caring. Um, you can have a very intimate relationship with someone that maybe you love, and that's different than being on a professional level. So the definition that I came up with for caring on a professional level was that it's unidirectional in that you are extending, the nurse is extending it to the patient. The patient doesn't have to give it back. And, uh, you know, certainly when we are as faculty, um, we might extend it to our students, but they don't have to give it back. <laughs> so you need directional, directional altruistic valuing of one human being for another within a relationship. Now, one of the things that most of the caring theorists had said was that caring um, needs to be a one-to-one -one relationship, that the person who's being cared for needs to know that they're being cared for in order for it to um, make a difference for them. So, for instance, you might care about orphans in Africa, but they have no idea that you worry about them, so it doesn't do them a bit of good. So they always talk about this one-to-one -one relationship. Even if it is unidirectional, they still need to have an awareness of it. Um, and the caregiver is uh, all focused on the care receiver for their well-being. So the uh, caring relationship is, is usually, it's not about the nurse. It would be about the, uh, the patient, of course, or the student. And it's a personal and professional value. It's definitely one of the core values in nursing. And um, the literature says that values are taught and learned. We start learning them as babies and we work our way up. And if they can be taught and learned, they can be changed, which is, I think, a very critical um, idea there. So um, it talks about uh, an affective attitude. Uh, so caring is an affective attitude that is manifest, manifested in a context by certain critical elements of behavior. So the value is something that we, um, that we prize, but it's manifested in our attitudes. So I did a little work on attitudes and values and beliefs. So this is a lot of Rokich who wrote in the 1960s. He talked about um, the whole system of beliefs and values. And he talked about it sort of being like a big spider web. And we have certain core values, and our beliefs hold everything together. If we get a different belief about something, it might change a value. For instance, if you hold a prejudice towards a certain group, you think that that group is um, you know, not as good as your group. If you meet that person from that group and find out, oh my gosh, they're just like us, that may be a significant paradigm shift for you. Like, it's not what I believe. It's not what I was taught. So uh, a belief is what an individual holds to be true. And beliefs are organized into belief systems. And then core beliefs are beliefs that are important to a person's self-identity and worldview. And one of the interesting things about um, you know, core beliefs going into a person's self-identity is that if you identify yourself as a caring person, you will go out of your way to do caring things to reinforce your self-beliefs and your self-identity. And um, sometimes when that's challenged, it's a, it's a big earth-shaking thing for people. Like, what do you mean I wasn't you know, nice to you that time? It's very upsetting to people. So we have these core beliefs about ourselves, one of which you know, especially for nurses, is usually caring. And um, I did find later on that, you know, being a caring person is usually what draws people into nursing. Whether they have everything else we need is a different story. So, um, so we talk about values or idealized core beliefs. So we have this idea of what caring should look like. Um, best way to act or believe, and then values motivate behavior. So as we said, if caring is our core belief and value, 
it will motivate us to go out and do caring things. Uh, okay. So we said the, the beliefs are what prompt our behaviors and our, be our attitudes are reflective of what we believe. So attitudes are acquired behaviors that reflect a person's beliefs about the world. An attitude expresses the meaning and the value that the person has um, for whatever is being discussed or the other person. So when you get the eye roll and the hip, you automatically feel uh, disrespected because that's what they're projecting to you. Their, their attitude is a reflection of how they value the individual. Um, and I'm, I think, you know, if, we're, if you're a mother, you've <laughs> <laughs> or anybody, if, you've, if you have a teenager in your household, you've probably all seen that. So um, when we're talking to our students about their attitudes, about, you know, we can guide their behaviors um, so that they express how they value the, um, the patient that we're working with. And feeling valued, as it says there, enhances human wealth and well-being. Feeling devalued undermines it. So one of the things that we wanted to look at to see what does caring actually look like, how can you express caring, is what behaviors would be involved in that. Because um, one of the things that we can certainly require is that people behave in a certain way. <laughs> right? So uh, a lot of what Watson talks about, she has 10 carative factors. And these are some of them. Um, so we, we kind of know when people are being genuine and uh, caring with us. And we can usually tell when they're being disingenuous with us also. Even if they're saying the right things, it's those very subtle signals that we get. So uh, Watson talks a lot about being, being presence, an authentic presence. Um, if anybody's ever gotten an email from me, you might have seen on the bottom of the email is that the best gift we can give anybody is our authentic presence. And uh, that comes from another theorist, Loco, uh, Locus, Loco, I think his name is. So, uh, so in, in, when we're expressing caring, it needs to be in an interpersonal and humanistic relationship. Um, and you see a lot of those words crop up all the time, benevolent, benevolent altruistic, attentive, engrossed. Uh, these, these kinds of words are what express caring. Later on, when I asked the students to describe what caring looked like to them, same words all cropped up. So the general sense that I got was that people know what caring looks like, and they know when people do care about them or not. Um, Okay, so then I got into role modeling, and I said, well, what exactly is role modeling all about? How do you go about doing it? And then we're going to put the whole thing together. So I said that uh, we found it's the most frequently cited, but nobody ever teaches you how to do it, right? What I did find was very interesting. I had to go all the way back to Albert Bandura of all people. Now, he's of the self-efficacy. Remember being in the 1970s and we all learned about self-efficacy. So I did not realize that Albert Bandura is also a big expert on role modeling. And he um, said so some of the uh, benefits of role modeling is very, very applicable for nursing because learners can observe and replicate complex behavior without costly trial and ever practice. So we can work through scenarios and practice without actually hurting somebody in the process. That's why I said it's a, a perfect teaching modality for nursing where in real life an error could be very costly. So it's sort of a shortcut to learn how to work through life. Um, what I did learn also, which was very interesting, was that even animals role model. Because when they're learning how to stalk prey and things like that, they play first. And play is almost a rehearsal for things. If they're hunting things that are almost as big as they are, um, you don't want to make mistakes there either. So it's actually a shortcut to learning life's lessons without 
having to suffer some of the consequences. And I didn't realize that at the time. The other interesting thing about role modeling is that if it's done correctly, it's not just changing behavior. Because we can tell somebody, you have to introduce yourself. You have to look them in the eye. You have to do this, that, and the other thing. So you can control behavior. But that underlying attitude often is there. And they, you can tell when people are going through the motions. But when, um, when people are, are working with role modeling, they're actually imagining themselves in the situation. And they are, um, they're kind of learning to value certain things. And it's the uh, learning to value the things that changes their behavior. So you're sort of starting from the inside out to change the behavior. And it can actually change the, the valuing, the behavior, the affect. And um, when we say self-esteem, the uh, self-esteem comes from reinforcing your beliefs about yourself. So if you uh, want to feel more confident, let's say, you know, it's one of those fake it till you make it kind of things. Um, you say, all right, I'm going to, you know, act confident. It's going to be successful. And then I'm going to feel more confident. So eventually you start changing your idea about who you are. And then it becomes a self-reinforcing uh, activity, which that's pretty cool because that's like um, four different things at once. All right. Uh, so that was one thing. Now, the one interesting thing I did notice, which is a little tough on on uh, educators is that it's kind of a delayed response. So we all know from our kids, you say things over and over and over to your kids and you think it's not getting through. And then you kind of sneak up on them one day and you hear stuff coming out of their mouth that you say, oh my gosh, they were listening, they got it. And that's one of the problems that we have in, um, in anything, especially in education, we often don't see the end product of what we're putting out there. We might hear about it anecdotally, but that's, that's the issue with role modeling, is that um, you have to be in the right circumstances for the behavior that you want to come out. And we may it may just sit there for a long time. So what we're going to find out about role modeling is that just because you don't see it doesn't mean they didn't get it. So I hope that'll be encouraging to people. So because we see all of these things in there, it's very uh, appropriate for nursing situations that we can practice things without being in a high risk situation. And that maybe two or three years down the line, if the student finds themselves in a certain situation, they'll respond appropriately. Um, just a very quickie, funny story. I remember getting a phone call from a friend of mine, and she was all excited. She was a new graduate, and she said, oh, I saw hypoglycemia, and I knew what it was, you know, because she had never seen it in school. And I think the same thing happens with role modeling. There's so much that we don't get to do in education, and then you're hoping that when the situation arises, that they'll get it, and they do. So that's the good news. <laughs> OK. Now, what I did find out about role modeling was that, as I said, there's a lot of myths about it. And one of the myths, one of the biggest myths, I think, is that it just happens, that it's a subconscious process. And Bandura said, no, it's not, that people actually are hungry for role models. They look for role models, and they choose their role models pretty consciously. And um, he also said, could it be subconscious? Yes, it could. But there is a way to make it explicit. And it's much more effective when we make it explicit. So he actually had steps. There was a, there was a how to do role modeling. And I. You know, I started with this as a building block to my uh, instrument because I had never seen these things before. So I figured I don't know if everybody was doing this or not. So what was in the steps? The first thing we have to do 
is, as it says, simply exposing students is not enough. What we have to do is draw their attention to it. Because I'm sure you've all said to your students, did you notice this? And they went, what? <laughs> you know. So unless they actually see something and pay attention to it, they're not going to get the message. Um, and sometimes they're paying attention to stuff that they're not supposed to. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot to draw their attention away from what we want them to do lately. So, so we need to say, did you notice the nurse doing this? This is a, you know, a, a good, um, good thing to do. Or did you notice that? That wasn't so good. So we really need to bring those things out. Um, Another thing which I thought was really interesting says multiple exposures under novel conditions helps to identify critical components. So one of the things that a beginning student is more likely to do is say, okay, when this happens, I do this. And then they get into another situation and they do something that doesn't fit the situation because they learned, well, you know, if this patient says this, I should say this. So by showing them multiple situations, they can say, all right, it's not those words. It might be the attitude or something along those lines. And the reason I found this interesting is because I just finished reading this new book by Brown called Make It Stick. And one of the recommendations that's come out uh, from educational research is that repeated exposures in multiple different ways is a great way for people to learn. Um, and Bandura was writing in the 1960s, and Brown just published this book last year. So you know, we got 50 years gone by, and the um, way people learn is still the same. So, so what we're looking for is we're looking for guiding principles to use, not, you know, not cookie cutter words. And by exposing the students in different conditions, we can do that. Now, how we do that? Because you know, one, of our, one of our big problems, of course, is always finding clinical placements for people. And what Bandura said, which I thought was interesting also, was symbolic modeling in mass media is as potent as interactive behavior. Meaning, I mean, he was working with the big old television sets and maybe five different TV channels, and that was it. But he was saying that you know, watching something on video is, is almost as powerful as actually being in there. So even back in the 1960s, it was talking about um, role modeling on, you know, on the media and movies. And, and I know that many of my colleagues use um, you know, film and, uh, and everything on TV. And you know, one of the things that parents always have nightmares about is the stuff that you see on TV is not the yeah, stuff yeah. that you want to have role modeling. So um, it works well. Even if you're, in, if you're in a situation or if you want to um, use a film or that kind of thing. And, and then you can analyze. I think it's easier on film because you can stop it and analyze what is going on. So, that, so that's the good news. In other words, sim works. So, <laughs> you know, so that helps too. Now, one of the things, since we need to draw attention to a role model, what are the things that attract people's attention? Um, Power or prestige. Now that's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so, you know, uh, depends on the person. Obviously, we always looking at sports people and, and again, media people. But in, in nursing, it could also be just anybody that, that brings respect. So now attractiveness um, doesn't have to be physical attractiveness, but I think it probably helps. Uh, <laughs> and intelligence and yeah, right. Oh, that was yours. Competence was actually uh, important because uh, people don't respect, if they see somebody that they think is incompetent, there's a lack of respect. Uh, Watson actually incorporates competence in nursing as a caring behavior. So when people see somebody who's um, competent, they, re they respect and admire that. Another thing is the frequency of associations. So uh, obviously parents become role models because they're there and they're, they're this constant contact. Um, it might be a little more difficult for people who have very large classes and don't get to really know people on an individual level, but 
it can occur as a one-sided thing. You don't have to have a relationship, but it's more likely to occur when you do have that depth of relationship. Uh, so, so you will also see it uh, a lot in the clinical situation where they really get to know those students. And then distinctiveness or uniqueness. I mean, that always draws our attention to something. Now, whether, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing, uh, it still draws your attention. So something that's unique or distinctive about that person could be anything. It kind of depends on the, um, on the beholder, as I said. So that's one. So there's four all together. All right. Now, just because they've noticed it, doesn't mean they're gonna remember it. As we all know, you know, when you're in class, you, we, we estimate what they remember, maybe 10 or 20% of what we tell them. So what needs to happen is some processing. They need to spend some time thinking about it, thinking about what would they do in that situation, and how does this fit in with what I already know. So they may say, Oh, I had something similar happen to me. How can I bring that into the, um, the clinical situation? I was teaching allergies today, and I saw a lot of people nodding their heads. And so, you know, so I started pulling out from them what their experience was with people who had allergic responses. And they were able to connect what I was saying. Uh, you have allergies too? <laughs> Olga happens to have that in her core area for her dissertation. Okay, so it was it was interesting. It's a response. Yeah, right? because well, because what was you know what we could do is is take their experiences and then bring them up to another level of understanding by saying, all right, this is what you saw. This is what's been happening on you know on this level. So they really need to be able to to think about what they saw, not just um, you know not just say, oh yeah, that wasn't so good, and, and stick it away. And then um, rehearsal reinforces retention. So it's like practicing anything. But rehearsal can be a lot of different things. As it says there, it says maybe overt or covert. So it could be actual practice. Certainly, we have students sit down and have a therapeutic conversation with somebody. That would be a practice. But journaling and reflection are also practices. And you see reflection coming up in a lot. Um, also Brown, the Make It Stick book, he's got a chapter on reflecting on your experience. What went well, what didn't go well, what could I do better the next time? And reflection is where the real learning occurs. So, um, so practice is always a great thing, uh, but you know, even sitting down and reflecting in a journal or even just sitting around you know, talking about something that might have uh, stimulated you or gotten you upset, all of those things help. So that's another good thing because we do a lot of that stuff. Now, another thing that Brown also says, but that Bandura said over 50 years ago, delayed response is more effective than immediate imitation. And again, that's a problem with the role modeling because um, you know, what we often do is we teach the students something, and then what do we do? We test it right away, and so they study for the test, and then they put it in the back of their heads and they don't use it again. And what the theorists have been saying over and over again is tuck it away and then pull it out again a little bit down the line. And the more you do that, uh, the way I describe it is we sort of wear a neural pathway to that. It's kind of like a path if you, you, know, you don't use it, you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. That the path gets overgrown with weeds. So we need to pull it out every once in a while, sort of at random, which is really what happens in a clinical area. You never know what skill you're going to need. But that's actually more effective. It, I thought it was even interesting because when we talk about things like test construction, they said, don't, don't teach it. Don't, don't write it down in the order that you've taught it. Mix it up a little bit. It's more effective learning. So the good news is that you know role modeling works in those situations. As I said, if you you know they'll pull it out three years from now and remember what you said or what you did, right? Then part three of role modeling was um, to see a response, and that's what my my problem was always. Well, you know, 
I, I treat them, the golden rule, right? You treat other people the way you want them to treat you. How come they're not doing it back, <laughs> right? And um, lack, uh, the good news is lack of overt response does not mean a lack of learning. So just because you don't see it doesn't mean they didn't learn it. Right? It may be delayed. It may depend on both external and internal reinforcement. And I'm going to get to the external and internal reinforcement in a minute because internal is better than external. Um, so whether they repeat the behavior you want them to repeat or not may depend on how deeply they went with it. Does it really resonate with their core values or not? Uh, for instance, if you want them to behave in a caring manner, well, how important is caring to them? It may not be as important as what's on their cell phone. So, you know, so, uh, so we have to uh, work on that piece. Now, as far as having them repeat the behaviors, uh, I think we are all fairly familiar with, you know, external and internal. External is a reward of punishment or a lack of punishment. This has important consequences for educators also. Because an imagined consequence is as effective as a real consequence. The reason I say this is important is I'm on the Academic Integrity Committee. And when we're thinking about values like, you know, you shouldn't be cheating on uh, an exam, we actually surveyed the students. And we found out that they, their impression of what the uh, consequences would be if they got caught cheating were way greater than what they actually are. But you know what? That's OK because they self-limit their behaviors, <laughs> you know? Um, another example, if you think that you're going to go to jail for life by running a red light, you probably won't run a red light. Now, is that true? No, but if you believe it, it'll limit your behavior. Uh, so, so sometimes that's OK. And it's interesting because role modeling sometimes is about imagined things. When you look at... Um, oh, I don't know, LeBron James, and you think that he's got the best life in the world, you might want to imitate LeBron James. Now, I'm pretty sure LeBron James will tell you he's got his own problems. But you know, a lot of times, it's about imagination. Um, the, when we do use external rewards and punishments, the imitation is more accurate, but it doesn't last. And we see this all the time, even in skill lab, because the student can spit back to you exactly what you want to hear, and then they promptly go out and forget it. <laughs> so, so if it's internal, it's much more likely to be persistent. And that's why we have to hit the, uh, the value system and the belief system rather than just try and change the behavior. So we're always looking for the um, values to come from inside, because then we also know that the person will be consistent about um, pursuing them. The, you know, they say that your character is what you do when nobody's looking, right? And you know, what guides us when nobody's looking? It's our own sense of ourself, and it's our own belief in who we are and what we stand for. So that's why the internal, Valuing a behavior because it reflects who I am is more reinforcing and more um, reliable in the long run than, uh, than just saying, well, you, you, know, you have to say hello every time you walk in the patient's room. Right? So self-rewarded behavior is more stable over time and adverse conditions and more adaptable to novel situations. Um, I, I also thought about the academic integrity issue in another way, in that um, the behaviors that we see in our students are the behaviors that they continue to do out in the field. So uh, you know, we have shown that if students are cheating in the nursing school, that they will continue to cut corners when they become professionals. So the, uh, the value system has not really changed. And you know, one of the things we like to think is we like to think we're giving transformative education. But we really have to think about that because, you know, we have to, that's a big goal to say we're transforming somebody because sometimes we're not. 
Sometimes they just behave themselves to, you know, because of the external rewards and punishments. And, um, you know, when we're not doing that anymore, then we don't have any control over them. Okay, so what does a good role model look like? Good role models know that they're being watched. <laughs> so they're aware of it. And that's going to come up again later in my findings. That's going to be uh, an important factor. Because a lot of times we are not aware of what you know what we're doing what we're saying and how many times have people people been caught on camera going oops shouldn't have said that right um, and role models choose to behave in an exemplary way even under difficult circumstances um, they seek out opportunities to model they're consistent with their message draw attention to critical elements point out other examples to learn from and here's something that I hadn't thought about um, they provide honest, timely feedback to students. One of the things that Bandura said was that if you don't correct somebody's behavior, not only does that person continue to do what they've been doing, but other people take a look at it and go, well, they got away with it. I guess I can too. And I see people nodding their heads. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. Um, so when you are, um, you know, with a group and you choose not to address the behavior, that behavior not only will continue, but it's contagious. So that takes a lot of courage to address. Uh, so we're going to see that cropping up as well. Right? Now, there are some, some things that people think about when they look at this. They go, ooh, wow. Uh, I don't know if I really want to stand out like that because many times, you know, one of the myths is that if I put myself forward as a role model, people are going to be looking at every little thing that I do, which means I got to be perfect. And very few people really want to put themselves under a spotlight. Well, huh, we can say a sigh of relief here because. Uh, one of the things that Bandura noted was that people, as I said, they seek out role models, but they can choose per certain characteristics that they will emulate and not others. For instance, I have a fashion role model. Uh, you know, I have somebody I call her my, my fashion muse. I don't particularly care for the way she behaves sometimes, but I like the way she dresses. So she can be my fashion role model, but not my behavioral role model. So, so the good news is that when people are choosing role models, they don't expect everything you do to be perfect. But because that is a, a myth, I wanted to incorporate that into the instrument that I use because I think people, people really um, are, are afraid to put themselves forward as role models. Um, another thing that you can see right away, honest, timely feedback is very painful and difficult to do sometimes uh, when you have to correct somebody. And, you know, there's always that fear that uh, if you do something that is not consistent with your message, they will catch you on it and they will, you know, bring that to your attention too. My kids love it when I make a mistake. They're like, ha, we caught you, mom, right? <laughs> and, you know, however, I, I use that as a role modeling opportunity also because they say, well, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> but people are afraid to role model because of some of those things. I mean, we're never all consistent 100%. Okay, so, so I wanted to, so I took all of these things and I wanted to incorporate them into my uh, instrument. So what I decided to do, um, I needed a role modeling instrument because there wasn't one. So I had to make one, which is, you know, sort of part of the whole process. And I'll talk a little bit in the analysis about what kinds of things went in there. Mm -hmm. right. So what I did was um, I said I really wanted more than one school because I was concerned about the influence of school culture. And I was telling Ronnie before, I was kind of concerned also because I said, what if one school turns out to be more caring than the other schools? That's not going to be politically correct. 
uh, but everything worked out well in the end. So I had uh, I invited 14 schools that were either AACN or NLN accredited, and uh, four accepted my invitation. So I thought that was pretty good. And what I had was I, I decided to do everything electronically because uh, there were many anecdotal or qualitative kinds of research done on role modeling and caring, but there hadn't been any big um, quantitative piece. And I'm a little bit of a, a math geek. When I took regression analysis, I actually liked it. People think I'm out of my mind. Um, they said, oh, regression analysis, that's when they make you hypnotized and you go re relive past lives, right? I'm like, no, but I really wanted to incorporate that in here. So I decided to do a big survey to find out what people were doing uh, out there with the role modeling. So what I did was I um, set everything up on SurveyMonkey and then I sent the, uh, the link to the dean or the chair of the program and then they forwarded it to the students in their program. So I never had access to any of their students. As a matter of fact, one group, apparently it wound up in a research class at one school, and I got an email from them, how did you find us? How did you get all of our emails? And I thought that was a great question. So I, you know, I explained to them how uh, I wound up doing that. And uh, I wound up with 231 usable responses. and. I had a little trouble with the faculty at the schools. They were not as um, responsive as I wished that they were. What I wound up doing with them, as time was growing short, I wound up uh, sending every faculty member. I went on their websites. I got all the names of all the faculty members. And I sent them paper responses. And uh, it was kind of against my better judgment. But my advisor said, put a dollar bill in there. It's the guilt factor. And so it was very cute because, as you saw, I got a 41% response rate from the faculty, and some of them sent the dollar bill back. So the guilt factor actually <laughs> worked. So when I get to my, um, my findings and my recommendations, I have some recommendations about how to do this in the future because some things worked and some things didn't. So what I had on there was um, I had, when I did the literature review, I found that certain things did affect caring. Uh, things like gender, age, previous education, there were some things that affected caring. So I needed some demographic data. Um, and then I included the caring efficacy scale, which was developed by Coates at the University of Colorado. And it's based on, guess who? Watson and Bandura, how good would that be? I have my two main theorists together. So efficacy is from Bandura, and caring is from uh, Watson. And they, uh, Watson and Coates actually know each other. They work together. So uh, that was in one of Watson's books on um, instruments to measure caring. Now, as far as measuring role modeling, as I said, what I had to do was come up with my own uh, survey based on the literature. And that turned out to be about 36 questions. Uh, and what I did with that was I had sent it to the people who did the articles on role modeling. And due to the miracle of the internet, they actually got back to me. And they were very helpful. And I did do a little test pilot to make sure that the form was uh, workable. Because I was making this myself, I also decided to use the same kind of scale as the caring efficacy scale, so it was very consistent, uh, a little easier to code, a little easier for the students, for the people taking it to, um, to do. Because it, it turned out between the caring efficacy scale and the role modeling values survey, it was about 72 quickie fill in the, the uh, Likert scale kind of thing. And that's getting a little long. Um, so I was trying to condense it and make it as easy as possible. And then I analyzed them using SPSS 17. So what are we up to now? 23, 24? <laughs> you know, but it'll, it tells you it's the passage of time. OK, so what's on the caring efficacy scale? It's 30 questions, and it's based on Watson's 10 carative factors. Um, Likert scale. Some questions are negatively worded. The reason I really liked it 
was because it had a lot of extensive testing done, not only on paper, but what they did in one study was they had um, the new graduate nurse and their supervisor both fill out the form so that the supervisor could correlate what she saw the new graduate nurse doing. So it was actually correlated with actual clinical observations. So that's why I felt, even though it was a self-reported scale, it would be as close as I possibly could to saying, yes, they really do these behaviors in practice. So I kind of like that. And then the role modeling survey, as I said, turned out to be 36 questions. I designed it with the same scale. Um, the uh, scale, because it was a negative three to a positive three, uh, it didn't really have a, a zero in it. You kind of had to force it a little bit to the agree or disagree stage, so just to get a little bit clearer uh, statistic. And it was evaluated by my experts, and um, I ran a little pilot study to make sure that it was usable. Okay. Now, uh, the analysis. Um, I compared a lot of different things. I wanted to see uh, whether there was a significant demographic change between schools. Uh, were they pretty homogeneous or heterogeneous? Um, was there any difference between schools in terms of their caring behaviors, which was something I was worried about. And then uh, the, since the role modeling value scale was new, I had to analyze the instrument itself. I was looking for some of the major themes, what contributed to the overall score, and to see how reliable it was. Wasn't really sure at that point. Um, and then I wanted to see what is the relationship between those demographic variables and role modeling scores and the caring scores also. So, uh, so those are some of the analyses that I did. Right. So there's a few more. The caring scores, as I said, I wanted to see if um, if it supported the literature because I, I actually went all the way to the, back to the work of Gilligan, who did, um, uh, you know, she talked about the differences between men and women, and so that came uh, that was part of the analysis. Uh, age became part of the analysis. All of those things to see about caring as well, and I wanted to see. Uh, is there any relationship between caring and role modeling in the faculty? And I also added in a, a short free response. So I, I didn't have any experience doing qualitative, but that was the most fascinating part of the whole thing. So I'll share with you a few things that I learned from, uh, from that. So I, uh, and then what I did was I tried to triangulate the quantitative and qualitative data to see if it all fit together and matched. Okay, so I did find the nice thing was that there were some significant differences between the schools. Uh, you'll see gender, um, highest degree, tenure in the faculty. Uh, so I, um, I felt like I got a, a good representation of what was out there that you know, they, I did get all of the constituencies um, in there. And the school demographics differed also. So I said, okay, uh, let's see if there's any differences in the role modeling or the caring based on any of these things. And I'm going to show you how this all fits in with my findings. So the four participating schools were different. And they are different in categories also. I had a couple of small schools, a couple of big schools, a couple of public schools, a couple of private schools. So it was a very uh, nice mix. And uh, I did, you know, we did uh, get a, a good representation of the different types of schools available. Uh, when I took a quick look at the survey itself, I was looking for reliability. The survey turned out to be a 6.21. I can't get up. There. Uh, seven is can you really good. Can you pour it for me? Can you just dump it out and put a tea bag in there? That was, <laughs> must be Nikki, we hear you. Yeah. And then five is less than adequate. So uh, for a first run, the role modeling values survey turned out to be pretty decent. 
I did identify some things that could come out and maybe make it a little more reliable on the next go around. So um, as, as always, there's always more work to do. All right. What we did find, there were some um, variables in the role modeling survey that were highly correlated uh, for factor analysis. So what I was going to do was tease out some of those main themes. So there were some that were very uh, evident, and I'll share those with you in a second. And then, um, sure. <laughs> so you know, so I, I had uh, done the analysis of the role modeling survey to try and identify what are the main factors in good role modeling, and um, and how do they uh, translate into practice. So this is what it looks like. This is called the scree plot. And there were 36 questions on there. So what this represents is uh, how much did each one of these add to the total. So usually what we do is we find the cutoff point. And um, so I wound up analyzing what went into those five. So I found like five major factors that accounted for most of the um, most of the score on here. So what did that come out to be? Now what happened was when I took a look, I, I am going to share some of the questions that went into this. Uh, we gather up the questions, see how much they contribute to the whole, and then try to figure out what they all have in common. And so this is my interpretation of what the um, what the role modeling uh, analysis said. Uh, so 20% of the variance was co component one. And it talked about, the questions talked about how do you use yourself as a role model, which seems pretty um, obvious, that role modeling is all about giving people examples to look at. So I uh, said so 20% of the variance was the intentional and explicit use of the self. And I do have those questions for you. Um, the second part, strong professional identity. So these were people who really valued being a nurse, valued caring, um, you know, talked about it all the time. And uh, I, I came across, I went to a seminar last week, and the gentleman who was presenting, he said, there's, there's two ways to look at it. You can either um, become what you do, or you can do what you are. And I think for most of us, um, you know, we came into nursing because we were caring people, and now we just are nurses to the core. And that's the kind of, of, of person that came out as uh, being the best role model, that they have very strong identity as a nurse. It's such an integral part of who they are that they can't turn it off. And most of us are like that. You know, I keep joking I gave it the office, but it doesn't go away. So a third theme that came out in the analysis was this, um, this moral integrity, this moral strength. And if you remember, before we had talked about uh, correcting people's behavior and how hard that is sometimes. Um, and I, I saw that a lot in some of the questions. And as I said, I'll show that to you in a second. The, that you really have to have this, this strength of convictions and that what you're doing is really important. And um, you're going to do it whether you get the support or not. And that also talks to that intrinsic valuing, that you will be doing this um, whether you get the outside support or not. Outside support helps. That's, a, that's in there too. But, um, but you really need the strength of your convictions. Institutional support actually came next. It's a lot easier to do the right thing if your institution backs you up. One of the things that I found when I was doing Rokic, who was the values and belief person, he said that for most people, their values are not all that strong. And if we want them to behave in a certain way, we got to make it easy for them to do the right thing. And then they just follow the path of least resistance. He said, you know, if you make it easy for them to file their taxes, for instance, they will. 
um, if it's hard for them, only the people who feel really strongly about it are going to do it. The people that don't feel so strongly about it are just going to uh, work around it. So as far as faculty are concerned, some people, most people feel very strongly about something. But there are other people who may feel like um, it's not worth it to butt heads with somebody about something. And in that case, having that external support uh, really makes it a lot easier for people. And as I said, I'll show you what the questions look like. And then the last component that I identified, which was specific for uh, what Bandura had said, was to teach by example or be specific to draw the student's attention to what you want them to see and explain why uh, you would um, want them to do that. So I'm going to go back and look at these and show you some of the kinds of questions that were on the uh, instrument. And so intentional and explicit use of self, this was uh, one that was the most important. It says, I, I explain my thinking and decision-making processes to my students. So you don't just say, this is a good thing to do. You say, all right, here's what I was thinking in this situation and why I did it this way. Or Again, it, you can also bring your, their attention to someone else who's doing it in an exemplary way. Uh, I do find just from personal experience, if I keep saying I, 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 they think I'm just talking about myself because they, I like to hear myself talk, and they don't get the point. So sometimes I'll turn it into I know somebody who, <laughs> and then they pay attention more. Um, so, you know, so that's, that was a very um, self-explanatory statement there. Uh, an example of being a professional, uh, you know, strong professional identity, being a role model means that I am held to a higher standard of behavior than the average person. I actually negatively coded that because what, what they're saying there is the myth. The myth was I got to be perfect to be a role model. What actually came out in the analysis of the data was that people who are strong role models don't think that they're better than anybody else. They think everybody should have the same standard, that the standard that I adhere to is the standard that all nurses should do. So the way this is phrased sounds a little weird, but I, as I said, it's negatively coded. So if you believe this, you got a lower score than if you said, no, everybody should be held to the same standard. And I want my students to come up to this standard. And so, um, so I thought that was very interesting, that a, a real strong role model says, no, I don't have to be any different. I should, everybody should be at this level, which I, I think reflects a lot of our faculty members. OK, now here's some of the questions that I use to see about this moral integrity. I'm afraid to give a poor evaluation to a student based on their unprofessional attitude because the student may sue me. I have heard this. I've heard this more than once. And of course, that gets a negative coding too uh, because good role models are not afraid to say something just because they're worried about the consequences. Uh, so if I make a judgment about a student's attitude and get it wrong, it will ruin my relationship with the student. So some people are afraid to say something because they say, well, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm misunderstanding? What if I'm misinterpreting? But one of the things that Bandura said was if you don't say something, it's going to get away from you. So again, this strength of your convictions um, is important. Being a role model means that I'm not allowed to make mistakes. Again, negatively coded, that is a myth. You are allowed to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, you know, so, and that's, it's another opportunity for role modeling. <laughs> so, and it gives my kids a little, little boost when they figure out that I do it. So, um, so that's where the moral integrity came from. Um, or you could, you could call it courage, you could call it strength of conviction. It takes guts to put yourself out there and be a role model. All right, now the institutional support, these are the kinds of questions that came up to support that. 
Uh, our program has clear written guidelines regarding what constitutes unprofessional attitudes from our students. And by the way, I did this before the civility statement, so <laughs> which is why I was on that committee. But uh, you know, students in our program are evaluated. So these were positively coded. If you have those things in place, it makes your job a little easier. You can say, I'm not the only one that thinks this is the standard that you should fulfill that you've got that institutional uh, support. Right? Um, school administration would support me. Now, these, these crop up with some very interesting qualitative data in the near future. Because when people commented on their experiences trying to be a role model, uh, we're going to see the, you know, when I talked about triangulation, the qualitative really, they wanted to talk about this piece a lot. So, um, so that, was, that came up again later on. Okay, and then these are some of the questions that we looked at for specificity. Uh, reflection obviously came from the Bandura piece. So many, many people do that. Certainly even the, the clinical paperwork that we ask students to do, supposed to be reflection. Whether they do or not, or the depth that they do, another story. Um, now, this other one, number 24, it says, I expect students to observe my behavior and imitate it without further explanation. Again, that one was negatively coded because that's a myth. Um, many people, however, do think that, that role modeling just happens. They should just watch what I'm doing and do what I do, and they don't stop and explain um, what they're doing or why they're doing it. And I use characters in literature or mass media. Uh, again, going all the way back to Bandura, that, that, that works. Um, and especially, I know, you know, we can talk about the Nurse Ratchet and, you know, I, 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 the, even the shows that are on now, you know, everybody's just doing crazy things. I said, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> I, I make it a point to bring up my professional values in discussions with my students. Because one of the things that you know, we, we do, we do so much stuff to um, support our profession. The students don't know half the things that we do. They don't have uh, uh, any idea. So, um, so sometimes, you know, I mean, many of our colleagues are going even to the Sigma conference this weekend. Um, the students should know about that. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, ten, 10 minutes? Okay, so we're getting there. So I wanted to see about what, it, what was it that would influence people to be a role model? Do the demographics um, play a role? And it was interesting because tenure did and rank did and usual teaching arena. Now, uh, the rank, as it went up, people became better role models. Uh, a tenure makes sense because once you feel comfortable, you can feel you know, a little bit more likely to um, say what you think and to you know, do those kinds of behaviors. I didn't know what the usual teaching arena meant because what I did was I said, I wonder if, um, you know, is, is there a difference between classroom and clinical or just classroom and just clinical? I also asked them about their specialty area, you know, whether it's pediatrics or psych, because I was wondering if psych might be a little bit more caring or whatever. Um, what I found was that as far as usual teaching arena and specialty area were concerned, they did influence the score, but then when I tried to separate it out, it didn't make um, a difference which one you were in. And I said, I didn't know what that meant until I realized that um, the, when, when you choose a, a specialty area, that's the one you really care about the most. So it didn't matter which specialty area you chose, you were very involved in it and very, um, you know, pro your area, and that came out in the role modeling uh, as well. So, um, so it, was, it, uh, it did make a difference in that you were very invested in it, but it didn't uh, it didn't vary from one area to another. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, I I did find a slight difference in one analysis on the role modeling scores between schools, but then when I tried to confirm it, it, it just wasn't there that much. So it didn't seem to make that big a difference. Um, 
Now, the qualitative analysis that I saw in the role modeling responses, I asked them to just address some of the things. If they wanted to talk about anything about the role modeling, they did talk a little bit about you know, why they thought it was important. Um, the good role models didn't hesitate to jump in there and say what they thought, uh, but they were very, very careful to say that if they were going to address a problem, it had to be done in a very respectful way. And they had to make sure that they had all their ducks in a row. They didn't want to jump to any conclusions. They wanted to make sure they had the documentation before they went to correct somebody's behavior, which is actually very caring of them. Um, I, they mentioned the personal cost. Some people had very... Uh, you know, strong feelings that I'm going to do what I need to do whether I get supported or not. Other people found it to be a, a gut-wrenching thing. They really had to think about the cost before they would uh, address certain situations. They did talk a little bit about, you know, students cheating and things like that. Sometimes they said it just wasn't worth the argument. And um, so there was a whole big range of responses that way. And that had the most to do with the um, institutional support. Uh, some of them said, bring it on. Great appeals don't scare me. Other people, actually, when they brought up uh, some kind of a problem, they were shunned by their colleagues, which I was appalled at. But it, it, that's what they were telling me. So, um, so that's why I said, like, even though institutional support came in like number four, it did have a big influence on whether people felt comfortable to do that. And even um, the tenure and the rank, they waited. They, you know, they waited until they felt secure to to do something. Um, just some quickies. The older people are, the more likely they are to say what they think. <laughs> so that accounted for 16% of the role modeling. Um, the highest, concentra highest concentration of highest academic degree did, again, this is one of those ones that it played into the entire uh, contribution. But it didn't matter whether you, you know, had your specialty in ed or med surge or whatever. Um, they, those were all equal. So I took that to mean that whatever you cared, you know, you cared about something enough to pursue it to the highest level possible. Um, I'm going to uh, show you for the caring scores too that the students had some interesting findings. So this is the caring stuff. So I, I analyzed the faculty and I analyzed the students because both of them did the caring survey. And um, a student GPA uh, the, wasn't significant, but there was a trend. So I have a, a screen for that. And I, as I said, thank God I was politically correct, because you'll notice there's no differences in the caring scores between schools and faculty alone, or students alone, or both combined. But there was a huge difference between faculty caring scores and student caring scores. And I said, well, that's a good thing, because we can at least role model the care. <laughs> yeah, one would hope. So let's take a look at some charts. Now, this one is a little hard to read, but I think this is interesting. This is students' caring scores by GPA. So what I noticed here was that the GPA for this one, this is a 2. This is a 2.3. This is a 2.5. This is 3. So it goes up to here. And what you'll notice is, even though it's not perfect, it's a little bit of a U shape. So what we're saying here is that people with a very low GPA had a high caring score. And then people with the high GPAs had the high caring score, too. Exactly, exactly. What I said was, you know, people say to you, oh, you're such a nice person. You would be a great nurse but they may not have the scientific bent to do it. I thought the funniest thing was this last one down here. This is the group that does not know their GPA. And they don't, and they are the lowest on the caring scores also. I mean, you know how, how focused nursing students are on their grades. So if a nursing student does not know their grade, 
that really says something about them. So we have a significant correlation between people who don't know their GPA and people who don't care. <laughs> what are the numbers on that, Mary? What are the numbers on that? On the students that didn't know their GPA. Oh, there were very few. There were very few. That's why it's so sh such a short number. Now, this actually was very interesting because I asked the students who their role model for caring was. Of course, the, most, the highest one is the parent, which is no big surprise. What concerned me was the second highest is the bedside nurse or someone that they know who's a nurse. Teachers are down here. All right, this is teachers. We come in at three and friends come in at four. The reason that this concerns me is when you see the qualitative results, um, they, there are so many times where, remember, if you're going to be a role model, you really need to be conscious of it. And when, when people are not conscious of it, they sometimes do negative things. And what it's telling me is that every bedside nurse it's a role model for caring, and sometimes they're poor role models. Um, the, we the, see, the we see that all the time in the practice arena. I'm sorry, Nikki, I couldn't hear what you said. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's... Sorry. Say it again. But that is seen all the time in practice. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, as, as much as you might want to discuss the fact that we have to consciously decide to be role models. Those that are looking for role models don't know that, and they yeah. are going to choose those at the bedside that they believe are providing the care that that's, they would like to provide. Absolutely correct, and that's why I'm concerned about that. Uh, what, what I did find in the literature was that students don't see their teachers, particularly classroom teachers, we don't see them as nurses first. We see them as teachers first. So they identify with the teacher role rather than the nurse role, and they're much more likely to identify the clinical people as their nurse role models. And um, that's why I said, if you're not aware that people are watching everything that you're doing, that is definitely a problem, as Nikki said. So, um, OK, so here's the qualitative We've piece. Got a few minutes left. Just, yes, it's a, we're almost at the end here, too. Uh, so, why is this person your role model for caring? When you take a look at that, you can see all the same words that we saw at the beginning <laughs> that um, students absolutely could pick out people who were caring and who were not, and that's why they chose them. Uh, I like this word fierce down at the bottom, though, that they, you know, they fear, you know, when you're a real advocate for somebody, that you really care about them. However, students also brought up the negative role models. There were several stories in there about, well, my brother was in the hospital, and I decided to be a nurse because I never want anybody else to be treated like that. And that, of course, is very painful when you see these negative role models. That came out frequently, I'm sorry to say, that students decided because of a negative role model. But the good news is that they decided they were going to fix it. So, you know, so they did react to it. This is uh, my last scale. And what I decided to do after I finished, after the defense, I came up with an aha moment. And I said, why didn't I do this before? This is comparing the role modeling score of the faculty to the caring score of the faculty. And I loved it because it's pretty obvious that the people that care the most are doing the role modeling and vice versa. But I felt very sad for this one down here on the end. I said, I think that's a burnout person Nick down Amber. there. Yeah, it's definitely. And it certainly is possible to have a high caring score and not have a high role modeling score because people are inhibited from, uh, from doing that because of the myths. But this turned out great. I love that one. I was like, oh, look at that nice line right through the middle there. OK, so, um, so the caring scores were definitely higher for the faculty, thank goodness. Right? Um, the uh, student, uh, at the, even though, and the, the politically correct news is that even though the, there were significant differences between schools, 
there were no differences between the caring scores and very little and non-significant difference between the role modeling score. I'm going to attribute that to institutional support. Um, and so role modeling, uh, you know, we really, I, I couldn't get a longitudinal type of a thing on this, but, you know, that's for another study. Um, and the school culture, you know, in the literature does account for about 15%. The cool thing was that was Simmons and Kavanaugh did those studies. And when I presented at um, Teachers College, guess who showed up? Simmons. And she saw herself being, uh, you know, in the literature review. And she introduced herself. And she must have been a baby when she did that survey. So conclusions and implications. A strong sense of professional identity and valuing helps. Right? Bedside nurses are more often role models than teachers, so they better be aware of what they're doing. And uh, development of professional identity needs to start right away and be nurtured throughout school so that by the time they get out in practice, they really have those strong sense of beliefs that we do so that they can continue to do what uh, we would like them to do. So, and so. And the institutional support, we said, you know, there, there is a value to age because it correlates with our caring scores. So we need to keep our experienced professionals in direct close contact with students and patients. So yay for experience. So those are some of my recommendations. And um, this is a reiteration of what we had talked about before, that it doesn't just happen. We have to think about it and plan for it. Right. And individuals who care about their profession make the best role models, of course. So yeah, like that. And then there's you know the references. Okay. So have a seat. Thank you. I'd love to sit down. And then fairness and keeping in timing. Yes. I want to talk some more. You can stay, but um, as we conclude this, uh, Nikki, I'm gonna say goodbye to you. You seem to stick around. Yeah, it was uh, I interesting. I'd like to have further conversation with you, Mary, at some point. Oh, you, some, Nikki, you know where to comments. find me. <laughs> yes, I do. I'm on her dissertation committee. Oh, so. great. Have a good weekend, Nikki. Have a good weekend, Nikki. Thank you. So can I take the microphone off yeah, yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see your little camera over here.